Good evening. Peace of the Lord be with you. Last Sunday, we all partnered together here at Good Shepherd as well as at Messiah to make a common journey with one another. We, we said that we would track Jesus' last five to six days as a young man, 33 years old, who was God and who was going to give his life as a ransom for many, of which you and I are amongst the many. And we decided as a congregation, both here and at Messiah, that we would make that trek together. And I've had the privilege this week of uh, adding to that my trek the, the 80 kids here at the preschool. We had a final chapel t together and a, ate ice cream with one another and had a meal with one another this week. I'll miss those children. I had the same opportunity to gather together with a, a, a Lenten chapel at Messiah with their 40 students. And that makes 120 children that are waiting for a pastor in both locations to speak to them about the reality of this that we're going to go through tonight. We are here not, we are not, we're, we're not here tonight to observe a funeral. We are here tonight to watch and to be part of an execution. And that is oh so grave of a reason why we've gathered together tonight. And it's not an imaginary execution, it's a real thing that occurred in time and space and place where Jesus Christ gave his life for us. And our world does not want to hear that much anymore, especially in the American culture. It's being marginalized, pushed away from the public square. We're, we're, we've eliminated it from our discourse and our conversation. But it will not st stop. Our culture will not stop that message from being spoken. And we're a part of the speaking of that, about God loving us so much that he provided a way for us to have forgiveness in our life, hope, joy, and eternal life. You tell me, logically, what's wrong with that? Hope, joy, forgiveness. There's nothing wrong with that. Our culture needs that. And when we come together during Holy Week from Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter morning, we are doing something that says, let's keep hope alive in our world. Let's keep joy alive in our world. Tonight is the part of Holy Week that's the hardest. It is for us to consider again the fact that Jesus died, an innocent man, a brutal death, and he was executed. And so we're going to think about that. Everybody says, let's rush to Easter. Why do we have to have this worship service on Good Friday? Easter means nothing unless we see Good Friday. Nothing. This core truth allows us to, to know in our hearts and our souls that God has done something extraordinary. This service is called the tenebrae service. It's a word that means the service of darkness. Because on this day, in the middle of the day, when Jesus dies, the world actually grows dark. The sun stops shining in the middle of a day when the Son of God gives his life for us, the light of the world. So we're going to go through this together tonight. Friedrich Nietzsche, a German Lutheran, a, a German uh, a philosopher born in a family of a Lutheran son, a Lutheran, the son of a Lutheran pastor. His father died when he was five years old. He became an atheist after that. Probably deep down in his soul, something was still percolating, but he was the one that said, God is dead. And that's where that phrase came from. A German atheistic philosopher, the son of a Lutheran pastor, when his father died at five years old. And tonight we know that's a true statement. God does die, but he does not stay dead. 
And that's the rest of the story. Whenever this opening song is going to be uh, sung here on the screen, uh, were you there, I will be lighting all the candles that will be necessary for our worship tonight. And then Pastor Uel has been is going to be reading for us the psalmody and the, the gospel lesson at the end of the service. Dwayne is going to help me move through our service together tonight as well. May we reflect on this great truth uh, tonight. Let me tell you that it's not morbid. It's just real. And so we move through this together as friends and partners in this journey toward Easter. Were you there? Palm Sunday is uh, identified with the word Hosanna. People are joyful, they're happy, they are excited, and the word Hosanna means help, save me, rescue me. We're glad that the king is coming, that he's going to do something extraordinary. Hosanna means, Lord, we need help, and we know you're the one that's going to provide it. When you make your way through Holy Week, the real accounts of Holy Week, as you move through any of the gospel lessons, or gospels in the New Testament, you will find that when you get into Holy Week, there's a change that occurs from Hosanna to crucify. The same people that were shouting, oh, here's our king, Hosanna, he's going to save us, help us, Lord. When those are the words of Palm Sunday, they come to the lips of people now saying, crucify. We said the words Hosanna, and tonight we are participating in our own lips saying, 
crucify him. That's where we get honest. Last night, uh, we gathered together at Messiah for a joint worship service of Good Shepherd and Messiah, and I invited the Lowen community and Pastor Well and the Tongan community and Pastor Sayosi to all come together over at Messiah last night. The church was full, and the young adults at the, for the Tongan uh, choir, uh, choir and uh, musicians, they provided the music for us last night. It was a moving, powerful setting where the blended face of Jesus was seen last night. And well, I want you to know how much I appreciated your words last night. Very much so. And I appreciated Pastor Sayosi's words last night as he brought a word from his community. Because we share a community together, uh, Pastor Sayosi and I do over there in, in Eva Beach. We're laboring in the same uh, uh, area. But tonight we have to go to the words of, of Crucify. In just a moment, you're going to see an eight-minute video as we begin our journey into the crucifixion of Jesus and the words that he spoke on the cross, seven sentences Jesus spoke from the cross. You're going to hear them all in order tonight. We're going to sing a couple songs as we move through them, just the, the verses of them. There was a trade that was made the day that Jesus was crucified. A, a horrible, dark, thug, violent, vile, human being that had no compunction about being hateful. There was a trade that was made the day that Jesus was crucified. They traded a man named Barabbas for Jesus, the one who did nothing wrong, the one who loved the sick, took care of the poor, gave sight to the blind, walked on water, fed the hungry. He was traded, Jesus was, for a guy that was a common, hateful, unbelievably vile criminal. And a young pastor named Judah Smith put this eight-minute uh, sermon vignette about this trade that was made. And it fits tonight because it is what occurred so that Jesus would be crucified. This man was set free, and Jesus was crucified. I want to begin with this picture of Barabbas. And remember, bar Abbas. The word bar means Son of. Abbas in this text means father. Barabbas, bar Abbas, means son of a father. Sounds like he doesn't know his dad. His dad walked away. There's a sickness in our society with the same thing going on now. Barabbas was a, the son of a father, and he was traded for the son of the father. That's the trade that was made. Listen to this piece, and then we'll dive deep into the seven sentences of Jesus. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross, and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper? What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Yeah. 
Give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience of Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, or you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. And God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father. we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. 
and it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. When I give him my sin, I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned. trade has been made and now Jesus goes to the cross and he speaks seven sentences on the cross and they are transformative and they instruct us about what the depth and the richness of the gospel is all about. We make our beginning this evening in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, help each of us to understand at times the world grows dark because of so many reasons. It grows dark because of disease, failure, sin, sickness, harsh words, addiction, broken relationships, and the list can go on and on and on. Grant each of us the courage to look at you on the cross and to hear your words as for me. Bring light to a dark world. Bring light and forgiveness to my life. Assist me, each of us, to be the light of your love for others. Protect all who toil in a dark world. In Christ's name, amen. Let us join together with words of confession. O most merciful God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us full remission of our sins. By the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you, give us confidence in your word, by your grace, that we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, amen. The almighty and merciful God grant you, being sorry for your sins, pardon and forgiveness of all your sins, an opportunity for the amendment of life. May you each receive a full measure of God's grace, courage, and strength. And as your pastor, this night I announce to you the full forgiveness of all of your sins, and I do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 22 is the words that Jesus quoted from the scriptures. And uh, they will be read for us by Pastor Uel. Remember, there were a lot of Jewish people at the foot of the cross. They knew these words. God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. 
they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl themselves, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. From birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Roaring lions thy terrors prey, all the earth must be wide, wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones to wax. He has melted within me. My tongue is dried up like potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. Verse 1 of Psalm 22, Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in this whole psalm, Jesus speaks. He quotes this on Calvary's cross for the people in their hearing. Tonight, as we move through the service, Dwayne will be guiding us through the next stretch of the seven sentences that Jesus spoke. And as we move through the service, I will be carefully putting out each of the candles, but the Christ candle will, will remain lit throughout our night tonight. The seven words of Christ from the cross. The prayer from Luke chapter 23, verse 33 and 34. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. We'll now sing, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. promise taken from Luke chapter 23 verses 42 and 43. Then he said, Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's continue singing.
the charge coming from John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Continue singing Lamb of God. Desolation from Mark chapter 15, verses 33 and 34. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until they were on three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Continue singing, Lamb of God. anguish from John chapter 19 verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. We'll now sing God loved the world so that he gave.
victory. John 19, verse 30. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave his spirit. Continue, continue to sing, God loved the world. The resignation taken from Luke chapter 23, verses 44 to 46. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Over the years, I've tried to be in the place where I extinguish the candles, not because I think that I'm better at it than anybody else, but because it reminds me that my sins are the things that took the life of Jesus. It's not somebody else's, it's mine. And as you see the candles extinguished, Perhaps you can say those were my sins that took the light of the world and darkened it. It doesn't work any other way. You can't say, oh, I could earn my way to heaven or I can be the bright light and God will love me because I let my own light. The reality is here is that our, our, our sins are the ones that took Jesus' life. When you go through a tenebrae service, you just deal with that truth. And that's all right. It's a great place to be honest between ourselves and God. And then God does a wonderful thing. He's going to raise this Jesus from the dead. Because then we can celebrate with joy our cry, Hosanna. Our crucifies go away and when we cry that. And now we, hit, we are going to be shouting in a couple of days, he's risen. But you have to go through Good Friday to get to Easter. It just doesn't work any other way. Let us join together with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Pastor Well is going to come to read this text for you and be reminded that there's two people that are going to be taking Jesus' body off the cross and to the grave. 
Joseph of Arimathea, a very rich, wonderful man, does great things with his wealth. And Nicodemus. Remember Nicodemus, don't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but receive the gift of eternal life. That word was spoken to Nicodemus first. He was the recipient of those words. And now Nicodemus is begging the body of Jesus off the cross. And we're going to go lay that body into the grave. Now it was the day of preparation. And the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw, saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body, he came and took the body away. The man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 50, 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Oh my. Whose grave was that? It was Joseph of Arimathea, the one who took that body. He felt the weight of Jesus' dead body in his arms. And he carried that body to his own grave, Joseph's grave. And he put Jesus in his grave. Laid him there, brand new grave. And Joseph had, had that hewn out of the rock for himself. And can you imagine when Jesus steps free from Joseph's own grave, what does Joseph think? Because he felt the weight of a breathless body. That grave holds no more power. And he's going to know it. Why did they break those legs? So that Jesus couldn't breathe any longer. But they didn't break his legs because he was already dead. They broke legs on the cross so that those who were being crucified could not push on the little platform at the, on, the, on the cross so they could keep their lungs to breathe. They could push down with their feet 
and then their diaphragm would work, and then they could continue to suck air as they're dying. So in order to move things along rather rapidly, because it not fitting into a time frame, they would come along and sledgehammer the legs so that they couldn't push any longer. And they would suffocate to death on the cross. That's what the Romans did. You can read about that in history. Hundreds of thousands of people died that way. Jesus was one of them. But he didn't have his legs broken because he was already dead. And it says in the scriptures, not one bone of his will be broken. And he fulfilled that. And there is Nicodemus. Can you imagine that guy seeing the very man that said, for God so loved the world, being laid in the grave? I bet those two guys were so very happy on Easter morning. Let us join together on Easter morning for that celebration. There's a couple of things that accompany a tenebrae service. This particular cross is going to be taken and placed on the on the uh, table right near the uh, exit of the, of, the, uh, of the sanctuary. And as you leave, this, this, this uh, candle will not be put out. Uh-uh. We live with hope in our hearts. This is a, a night where we recognize his death, but we do so in the overarching truth of the resurrection. Pastor, if you would come forward, please. If you would take this to that table and Martin Luther writes, the person who has no Good Friday and no Easter has no good day at all throughout the year. That is, the person who does not believe that Christ died and rose for him is lost. Part of the tenebrae service is to close the book. And that book is a signal that Christ has died. But we do so with this sound because it has an overarching truth of the Christ candle being still ready for us for Easter morning. And this is something that is joined together for centuries and centuries and centuries at the tenebrae service. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. The Lord lift upon you his countenance, his presence, and give you peace as we await together for the resurrection of Jesus from the grave.